In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever into the ages of all ages, amen. During Lent, we've been doing a series on arising up, raising up our, in our spiritual lives and raising up specifically in prayer. And in the first week, I did a little survey to see how people felt about prayer. Um, and um, I was feeling a little you know, like my prayer life was also a little bit on the decline. Um, and um, I asked the question, how have you found prayer pre-pandemic versus now? And about two-thirds of people said they felt that it was harder to pray now than it was before the pandemic. Um, and then I, a few other questions as well. And so that first week, we really talked about how prayer is a me deep and meaningful connection with God. And I gave us all the homework that if you've stopped praying entirely, if you're already praying and you're praying well, please carry on doing what you're doing and pray for us, those of us who are struggling. But if you are have stopped praying completely, if you don't really, you don't have any time of contemplative prayer at all, time where you stand alone before God in your room, <clears throat> I was recommending that you and I start with just five minutes a day. Five minutes. Put a timer on your phone, put your phone away and stand before God and speak to him in whatever way you so wish. If you wish to tell him what's on your heart openly, that's fine. If you wish to pray prescribed prayers from the book of hours or the Jesus prayer or whatnot, that's fine as well. But that, that let, us just, um, let us just stand before God, be in his presence and enjoy his presence for five minutes a day. And that was the first week. Then the, the week after that, um, I actually spoke about how I pray the liturgy. Um, and that the liturgy is not like a two or three hour long prayer, but rather it is a, a, a series of two to four minute long prayers, a whole bunch of them. Um, and I summarized um, um, how I pray, and this is how I've been praying in the liturgy since my late teens. So this isn't because I'm a priest. This was like my 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 background hack. If you could hear my thoughts, what's going on in my mind as I'm standing in the liturgy. And I shared with you, as humbling as it is, I get distracted too. Sometimes I just stand in front of the altar and press play, you know, and the recording, the recording goes and I realize, oh my goodness, we're in the commemoration of saints. When did we get here? You know, what happened? Right? And I, I wake up. I only wake up in a certain prayer. What do I do when that happens? Um, and uh, if you missed that talk, it's recorded, it's on our YouTube channel, um, and several people have already asked for it, so we've already edited it and reposted it, uh, the edited version on our YouTube channel. Go and find it there. Um, it would seem like it's been of high value to some people, and maybe it would be to you as well. Today, we're going to talk about prayer as being with God. Prayer as being with God. And so... Last week, yeah, I get, two weeks ago, I gave you the prayer rule of five minutes a day, right? And, and the Lord says, I love them that love me, and those who seek me early shall find me. And suppose you know this promise, and suppose you took that commandment, that, that commandment from me in the first week, about five minutes a day, and you set your alarm to wake up 15, 20 minutes earlier than you usually do. And you set your alarm and you woke up and you spent time with God. And you know what? That five minutes wasn't enough. And you loved it. And you really did connect with God. A real and deep, meaningful connection did happen. And you rejoiced in that moment. And your soul ascended to heaven. This is an icon of the ladder of divine ascent. And indeed, indeed, you did feel carried up to heaven. Suppose, just suppose, and you did have a marvelous experience of God in those five minutes, right? Now, what happens to the other 23 hours and 55 minutes of the day, right? You know, we get, we're at work and we're busy and phone calls and this and that. And it would seem like everybody wants it would seem like everybody is trying to grab a bite of you. Everybody wants a piece of you. The phone is ringing. Emails are coming in. Your boss needs something. You're, you're late to a meeting and this and that. And before you know it, it's you know dinner time and this and so on. And, and you get to the end of the day and you're like... And the zen of those five minutes, the joy of those five minutes, the presence of God of those five minutes could have been a lifetime ago right? It could have been an entire lifetime ago. 
after all the busyness of that day. And if you try to pray in the evening, if you take, if you, if you, if some of you have come to me and said, I'm doing the five minutes, Abuna, what's the next step? The next step is another five minutes in the evening, or if you were doing the evening, do the morning or whatever to try to pray twice a day for just five minutes. That's step two, right? And if you try to do that and you found that you prayed and you connected with God and then you had busy, 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 and then you tried to connect with God again, you find that in the evening, we're so cold, we're so dry. But in addition to feeling like you're starting from scratch in prayer with God, in addition to feeling like the, the, the beauty of prayer this morning was a lifetime ago, you're also tired, exhausted, drained, anxious, worried, have a million things on your mind, and that prayer becomes almost impossible. And so we find ourselves doing this, ascending to God and then falling back. Ascending to God and then falling back. And we feel like we're going nowhere. Or at best we feel that we started well and we've kind of plateaued. And so the saints give us the saints give us advice about how to pray to carry the grace that God has given us in the morning, to carry the grace that God gave you the evening yesterday through your day and let it be the momentum of your next prayer, of your next time where you connect with God. And they tell us the secret, the secret is not to make prayer an activity. I must do the dishes, fold the laundry, pray to God, chase the kids, make sure they don't burn the house down, etc., etc. It's not, it's not something on the to-do list. It's being with somebody. And for the most part, I'm not a philosopher nor a psychologist, so there's much more educated people in the audience I know can, can uh, correct me. But in general, doing and being... Are, are mutually exclusive. Doing and being are mutually exclusive. I'm either doing something or I'm being with someone. You got to choose. You got to choose. So I'm either doing prayer. Okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to let the day pass before I get this done. You know, and I'm going to do the prayer or I am being with somebody. But the saints are teaching us to not just be with somebody for those five minutes, but to bring those five minutes with me into my day, into the busyness, into the phone calls, into the emails, into the meetings, into, into, into. Bring, bring the grace that you experience. Bring God. Hold his hand. Hold his hand and bring him with you. In fact, they encourage us to think of God every moment of the day. They, they encourage us to think of lovey-dovey things to say, cheesy lovey-dovey things to say, and say them to God all day long. Say them to God all day long. And remember the grace of the morning and look forward to the quiet moment of respite from all the obligations of life in the evening. Don't make God another thing on your to-do list. Make God how you escape from your to-do list. Make God how you escape, how you procrastinate your to-do list. I'm not encouraging procrastination, but sometimes we just want to run away from it all. Sometimes we just want to pull the covers over our head for a few minutes and let the waves pass over us. Let time with God be that. And the saints are telling us that the same way that water overflows out of a bowl, if you keep filling it, even if it's a drop at a time, if we keep filling our mind and our hearts all day long, one thought at a time of the love of God, of how much we love him, of how much he loves us, of the good things he said to us. What did he say to me this morning? What did he promise me this morning? How has he helped me? How has he rescued me? 
and I'm filling my mind and my thoughts with these thoughts all day long, all day long, all day long, all day long, the evening doesn't become, the evening prayer doesn't become a chore, a task, a thing I have to do when I'm exhausted. It becomes the natural overflowing of the feelings of love and desire in my heart for God. And then in the evening I can come and I can find that place of stillness before God. And I can let all of what was inside me all day long, the good and the bad and the ugly, all of it just pour out before him in that place of stillness, right? But the secret, the secret is really connecting with God. Back to what we were saying in the first week, not doing prayer, but being with God, truly being with him. Now we did the five minutes in the morning. Now we're talking about trying to be with him all day long, all day long in little ways. I promise you, not big ways. I don't do anything big. I've tried. I'm a big fan of big things. I love big things. I never do them. I try, but I never do them. And so I've learned over the years not to be so enamored with the big things. They look really bright and, 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 and exciting. But you know what happens in the end? They don't get done. They don't get done. And then they're just nice little theoretical things, but they don't get done. So what I'm encouraging you to do is to do what the saints teach us to do, to do little things, to do little things. And the first thing, the thing that the saints are teaching us is to pray arrow prayers. Arrow prayers are these very short prayers. Like I'm talking two words, prayers all day long. And to get used to saying these things and to let them just slip off our tongues. Lord bless, Lord have mercy, glory to God. Save me, O Lord, Lord forgive me. The church, like in our liturgy, okay, let's be honest, we say Lord have mercy like 10 billion times, right? The church is trying to put the, the, the phrase, Lord have mercy, at the tip of our tongues. It's trying to accustom us to saying the words, Lord have mercy. Why? Because I promise you, it's probably the best response to just about anything, right? You screw up at work, Lord have mercy. Somebody blames you for something you didn't do, Lord have mercy. Somebody praises you for something you did do well, Lord have mercy. Somebody gives you credit for something that you didn't do, Lord have mercy. You can say, Lord have mercy, about anything about absolutely anything. And it would be the right thing to say. I'm not suggesting you have to say this out loud in the middle of a meeting. Maybe, if you so wish, you're more than welcome to, right? But you can say it under your breath. When I led a team of 20 some odd, I used to say when someone would thank me, my wife taught me this, she taught me to answer back and say, thank God, and I would say it out loud. It was appropriate. I led my own team and so on. They knew I was really into God and really into church and Christian. I had, you know, Bible verses all up on the wall in my office and whatever. It was my way of coping with the stress of the world, right? And that's fine. Maybe you can do that at work. Maybe you can't. Maybe that's not appropriate or it's not okay. Whatever. That's fine, right? These short prayers where we, our heart reaches out to God, reaches out to God, Lord, save me. Glory to God in all things, right? Or the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, the sinner. Short, little, little prayers. Another thing which we can do, second to the arrow prayers, is to make an effort to give glory to God in all things. To give glory to God in all things. To expect to God be the glory, not to me nor to my partners or colleagues or whoever, but to God be the glory. Again, this doesn't have to be something that I do explicitly, but give God, give God the credit. On the, um, and this is sort of living out the commandment of St. Paul, therefore, whether we eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything that I do is that I, I wish, my deepest wish and desire is for the whole world, every single person, to know how wonderful my God is. How wonderful my God is. And to love him, not as I love him, as he ought to be loved. As he ought to be loved. To love him as he loves us. That's my wish. That's my dream. And glory be to God. Glory be to God in all things. Right? And so... We printed this prayer 
Um, this is one of my favorite sort of contemporary saints. He only passed away uh, about a, a, a year or two ago, Father Angelus del Antoni, and he used to teach people to pray the Jesus prayer, but he was teaching people who were very simple, almost illiterate, and so he would teach them how to say, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, the sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, save me. Lord Jesus Christ, help me in this presentation. Lord Jesus Christ, help me to tie my shoes. Whatever it is, Lord Jesus Christ and so on and so on. And then the name of Jesus becomes on our tongue all the time. My, my, uh, a, a friend of mine is a monk who was his disciple for, for you know, a few decades. And um, one of our servants here at church was visiting in Egypt and, and she visited my uncle um, and she brought back this picture. And I just looked at, at this picture and I could see how Abun Angelos El Antoni, the, the fellow in this picture, and his prayer, which is on the back, um, it was deeply transformative to me. And so we translated it and printed it for you all, and we've, we've been waiting for a, an appropriate opportunity to, um, to, to distribute them to you, and so maybe today is the right day, right? Maybe these short prayers, you don't have to pray the whole card. You can pray the whole card, all 20 or 30 Lord Jesus Christ prayers that are on the back, or you can pick one or two. Yes, please hand them out. You can pick one or two that you feel touch you or move you, and you could you tell yourself, today at work, I'm going to pray this. I'm going to aim to pray this all day, um, all day long. But let us, let us together make a deal that God is not going to be something that we do in the morning and some that, something we do in the evening. God is not brushing our teeth. God is going to be something we do all day long, like my dentist would like me to be flossing all day long, right? God is going to be something we do all day long. Not something we do, but someone that we choose to be with. And God isn't asking you to do anything differently. I promise you, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite contemplations I read about Jesus and about his disciples. Jesus tells his disciples, now you will be fishers of men. Who does he say that to? He says that to four of his disciples, not all 12, only four. Guess what the occupation of those four was? Fishermen. He doesn't say it to the tax collector. He doesn't know the first thing about fishing. He doesn't say it to the zealot in the desert. He hasn't seen water for 20 years. He doesn't say it to, he says it to those who were fishermen. God is not calling you to glorify him by doing something different. You have to change your occupation. You have to go become a monk or a nun. You have, to, you have to do this. You have to do that. Maybe if you're living some immoral and sinful life, yes, it will require a drastic change. But more, most likely, God wants you just the way you are, exactly as you are, in the job you are, in the place of occupation that you're in, or the school that you're in, or the place that you are. He wants you to offer him yourself so he can be the light of the world in that place he wants you to be the lantern that he can put his light inside of in that place not a different place he puts you there for a reason he puts you there for a reason he doesn't want us to change what we do he wants us to change how we do it how we do it that before i used to go to job to, to my job and to my work because I needed a paycheck because I got to pay the bills. Now I realize that I'm not paying the bills. That's really cute. One day I was really worried about money, okay? I was really, really worried about money and I was praying. And I was praying and I was really, I was so worried. I was extremely anxious. And um, I didn't hear a voice or see a light from heaven or anything, but I almost felt like a tap on my shoulder, like God was tapping me on the shoulder and saying, oh, you're so cute. You thought you were paying the bills for the last 30 years? That's so sweet. Hey, folks, angels in heaven and saints, he thought he was the one paying the bills. Isn't that sweet? You know, my daughters aren't here. No, they're not. They took me out for dinner on my, uh, on my birthday. And uh, um, one of our daughters found like a used Walmart gift card or something at home. And she calls it her credit card, right? So she was insistent to pay for dinner for my birthday, right? So we let her pay for dinner for my birthday. Um, we, 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 we didn't dine and dash and we didn't end up, you know, having to wash dishes. Somebody, Mary or I, might have snuck to the back and, and paid when no one else was paying attention. God's been doing that my whole life. You're not going to work for a paycheck. 
You're the son and daughter of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You don't need to work. You don't go to work because because otherwise you'll starve. He feeds the birds of the field. He clothes the lilies of the field more gloriously than any of the retailers on Bloor Street. You don't go to work because you need. You go to work because he sent you there. He sent you there for a purpose. He sent you there for a purpose. So do that purpose for his glory because that's what it's for. Because that's what it's for. Furthermore, moving along, in the psalm of the liturgy today, it says, seek the Lord evermore. Seek his face evermore. I couldn't help, as I was preparing for today and then reading the readings of today, I couldn't help but it catch my eye. Seek him in every moment of every day. Seek him at work. Today is not Monday, um, sorry, two or three weeks ago was about praying in your room in quiet for five minutes a day. Today is not about that. Today is about the office. Today is about work. Today is about the hospital. Today is about wherever, wherever you are, your primary place of occupation. Seek him there. I worked in this one hospital. The elevators were horrible, were horrible. And as a, as a, as a, as a, as a point of stubbornness and laziness, but I would never, I would never, um, have admitted that at the time, I refused to take the stairs, right? And so you'd stand and wait for the elevator for five, ten minutes sometimes. It was infuriating. I used to find myself getting really angry about how, like, the, just the bare necessities of the hospital were so poorly maintained. And then I realized in those moments, one day I was so upset about the elevator, and I felt like God was telling me, you know, you could use this time for something useful rather than getting angry. And I, and I looked to God and I said, like what? And I felt like God was staring right there at me, looking at me in the eyes. Just looking me in the eyes. Pause in the middle of your day, in those wasted moments of the day. Pause and look at him. Behold him, like it says in the Psalms. Look and see how wonderful he is. Look and see how kind he is. Look and see how gracious he is. The word that the, that the saints use for this is contemplate God. Pause for a moment and think to yourself, if God is indeed omnipresent, if he is everywhere, he is here on the 12th floor, and he's also on the 18th floor that I need to get to whenever this elevator decides to come, right? And he is already where I am not. And he is already preparing the way before me. Isn't that insane? Is it in, insane that we pray in the liturgy and the litany of agriculture and the fruits, we pray and we say, like, Lord, prepare it for sowing and harvesting. We're saying, Lord, while the farmer is asleep in his bed, you go beforehand and prepare the field for him. Who's the master and who's the servant here? Who's supposed to be sleeping and who's supposed to be working? The paradigm has been flipped on its head. God, in your omnipresence, you are preparing the way before me. I am the servant should be preparing the way before you. You are the one who's gone ahead and are preparing the way before me. How humble you are, God. How wonderful you are. And you do all of this in secret, in quiet, no fanfare. You don't, you're not waiting for a trophy or a medal or even a thank you. You're doing it out of the good pleasure of your heart that you prepare the way before me. And this elevator is taking 400 years to come to take me up six flights of stairs. But you're already there, Lord, preparing the way before me. How lucky I am. Blessed, fortunate, gifted. To have this moment, Lord, let the elevator take an extra five minutes where I can pause and I can enjoy who you are. I'll tell you, the main enemy of my look the eye God, look my God in the eye moments, can I tell you, my main enemy of doing that is this guy. Because I can work 24 seven, because my office is right here in my right, you know, left top pocket, right? Whatever it's called, right? And I can, I can get work done any moment of the day. Now I stand in the elevator, sending emails and replying to messages and getting stuff done. And there's work that's got to get done. So I'm just 
you know, I've got like a thousand things that I'm pushing, little little projects that I'm pushing. So push this one a little, 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 push this. And then when a spare moment arises, what do I do? I pull my phone out and I keep working. Back to the busy slide, hey? Back to, I got exhausted just talking about it. You know what I've been doing for the last two weeks? I flip my phone into grayscale. Do it, try it. It makes your phone disgusting. You won't want to touch it. Honestly, it's unappealing. It's painful to use. I was doing a Zoom talk, a, a small group meeting, and it was still in grayscale. And I couldn't tell who was who. And the meeting was moving so fast, I didn't have time to like go to the settings and change it back. It was really embarrassing, right? But it's good. It's good for my soul. It's good. It's good for my soul. It's good for my mind. It's good for my, 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 my mental health. It's good to pause, to have moments where I can pause. Get refreshed by goodness, by joy, by cheer, by kindness, by someone who wants nothing from you, only wants goodness for you. Pause. Stop in the busyness. My favorite line these days in the liturgy is meet and right, meet and right. Truly, indeed, it is meet and right. It is fitting and right that we praise you, that we glorify you, that we bless you. Honestly, honestly, when you pause and you take a moment and you think to yourself, who in this room is the most worthy person of my time, of my effort, of my energy, of my attention? I honestly, I love you all to death, but I can't find any more worthy cause of my time or my attention or myself, really, than God. He is the one who is worthy when I pause. Everybody is great. People are kind and loving and so on, but they disappoint you, not, not because they want to or whatever that happens, right? I don't, I'm not bearing any grudges. I'm just saying, stating the reality, right? Everybody's limited and this and that and so on. A thousand things, a thousand, a thousand reasons why God you know, doesn't compare. You can't compare to him. He is worthy. When you pause in the middle of the day and you contemplate on this, you contemplate on his worthiness, it fills you. It fills me. It fills me with joy, with cheer. And it carries me. My soul ascended to him in my morning prayer, and it continues to carry me throughout my day. So when I get to my evening, my evening prayer is not starting from scratch all over again. One of the Psalms we pray in the morning says, Blessed is the man who doesn't do, doesn't do, doesn't do. And But what does he, what does he do? Whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates on it day and night. Day and night, he's thinking to himself, isn't it amazing that God said this? Isn't it amazing that God said that? I have to tell you, my biggest beef with King David, okay, is that I try to force myself to do God's commandments because I genuinely believe that he is worthy, but I have to force myself to do them. Like, I don't want to do them, but I, I want to want to do them, right? He looks at God's commandments and says, your word is sweeter in my mouth than honey and than a honeycomb. He looks to God and says, your commandments, God says, and he says, that's amazing. Why don't I think of that? I want to be like that. I want to be like that. And when I said that to my father of confession, he laughed at me. And he said, keep contemplating, keep saying the words of King David, and one day God's words will be sweeter to you than the honey and the honeycomb. Every day is beautiful when you hold the friend, hand of your best hand. Today's message is meet God in the morning, get ready to meet him in the evening, but make sure you hold his hand all day long. Glory be to God forever.